Hi, everyone. Welcome to another exciting, academic, comics-focused episode of Words, Images, and Worlds. We are overlooked, overwatched, what's the correct word there? I don't know, by uh, Spider-Man up in the corner, it looks like. And joining me and Spider-Man on this episode is Dr. Gene Cannonberg Jr. May I call you Gene? Is that okay? Gene is the, is the preferred nomenclature. All right. All right. Well, well, thank you so much for coming for a second talk. Um, we Thanks spent, for having me. My pleasure. Yeah. You know, we spent a little bit of time talking through some questions last time uh, and glad to follow up and explore some new avenues. And you've also shared your dissertation link with me, which I, I greatly appreciate. Um, so maybe we can we can sort of start there just to give listeners a brief background um, about your interest in comics and your publications a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I did my dissertation on comics in the dinosaur age of comic scholarship. Uh, <laughs> I defended it in 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called uh, Form, Function, Fiction, Text and Image in the Comics Narratives of Winston McKay, Art Spiegelman, and Chris Ware. Nice, nice. Uh, and... Uh, 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 I went to grad school with, amongst other people, uh, my good friend Charles Hatfield, mm -hmm. who I met in grad school, and who's gone on to become a uh, dynamo in the field of comic scholarship. And also people like uh, Wendy Goldberg and Brian Kremens and Kate Laity. And we were kind of the Yukon Comics Mafia, because uh, we were all at the University of Connecticut, and we were all doing lots of uh, comics-related things. And I think everybody still does to a certain extent. Uh, Brian published an amazing book on Captain Marvel and memory, not uh, the current Captain Marvel, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the Shazam Captain Marvel. And it's one of the best written academic books you will ever read. Uh, it's, 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 the, it's the very academic book that's a joy to read. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the, 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 the prose itself is beautiful. I love when that happens. I love when academia yeah. can actually be accessible, enjoyable. Love that. <laughs> yeah, and it and it and it's super smart at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's not dumbed down to make it interesting. It's just it just everything flows beautifully. But anyways, uh, so there was a bunch of us there doing comics at the same time, and Charles and I uh, actually wound up skewing our previous dissertation topics towards comics instead. And Thomas uh, Roberts, who was a professor there, who was actually not graduate faculty, uh, Charles and I were very precocious. We were running international conferences and things like this as graduate students. And uh, since we were sometimes publishing or doing, we were more active than some of the faculty members, hmm, uh, <laughs> they kind of gave us a little more leash and Charles's dissertation on uh, renaissance and restoration literature became a dissertation on comic on alternative comics and my dissertation on text and image in anglo-saxon manuscripts became a, com a dissertation on text and image in american comics and uh, what i wound up doing is i chose three of my favorite comics artists at the time mm -hmm. and at this when I started writing, no one had written anything about Chris Ware yet, except for a couple of reviews. Uh, so I was like the first person to write about Chris Ware academically, nice, which was nice. kind of cool. Uh, and I had the brilliant idea that academics don't do this. Or if you're a grad student, don't do what I just did. Uh, what I did was I had the great idea that every one of my chapters would be a publication first. Oh, wow. So, yeah. so, so everything from like the introduction and each one of the chapters I had placed in various journals or book chapters or whatever like that, that would get me to actually finish <laughs> because I had <laughs> these deadlines along the way. It took me a long time, but I did it. But the problem is what that gives you is not a dissertation. It gives you a Frankenstein manuscript mm -hmm. that you then have to try to pin stitch together because what I hadn't realized as a graduate student was that, oh, every publication has its own needs and wants. And that doesn't really give you a coherent dissertation. So I had all these things that had already been published, which was great. But at the same time, I had these different things. Yeah. And so yeah. it was a matter of trying to 
stitch it all together in a way that the committee would say, okay, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing that graduate students need to know is that a dissertation is not a book. A dissertation is a dissertation. Those are two very different things. Yes. <laughs> and a, the best dissertation is a completed dissertation. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a graduate student, listen very carefully. Finish. Yes. I, I'll put that up in big letters. A good <laughs> dissertation is a done dissertation. That's what yes, my that, committee members said, too. So, that is know. the best <laughs> dissertation. Yeah. Per perfection is not what you're going for because we, if you want to make it perfect, that's what the book is for. And the book's not going to be perfect either. Right. Right. <laughs> because nothing is, but anyway, so that's what, I, that's what I was doing. And I was really interested in page design. I actually wanted to call it text image and layout, but since I already had form function and fiction, they said, you can't have two triplets in your title of your dissertation. That's just overboard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but I was really interested in layout and how all the image, all, all the elements on the page kind of work together. And that's kind of been the defining thing in all of my work one way or another, including uh, about nine years ago, once I became a cartoonist myself, finally, in a, in a semi-serious way. Yeah. Um, it's all been about how do the images, how do the various elements on the page kind of uh, work together to do whatever it is that comics do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh so i'm I've, and again if you look at winsor mckay spiegelman and Ware, that's all that they're interested in practically mm -hmm. is balancing those different images those different elements i keep saying images different elements in different ways and even later on when i look at well i've i've tried to write about linda berry who is my absolute favorite cartoonist several mm -hmm. times and those I've never published anything on her really because I've published I've presented about her work at different conferences and basically every time I try to write about her I basically just say isn't she cool in different ways <laughs> because I can't I intellectually love those first three cartoonists uh -huh. and I, I intellectually but I also emotionally am so attached to Linda Berry's work. It speaks to me on every level, not just formally, because I think formally she's much more interesting than I think a lot of people give her credit for. Mm -hmm. But also just she's as skillful with words as she is with images. Yeah. Yeah. Just as a just as a prose person. The prose in her comics is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. And uh, it's, again, I can't, I can't get critical distance from her no matter how hard I try. And I was able to take a, I was able to get a one day seminar with her once because she, because she, because now she's a professor of what? Imagination and creativity at University of Wisconsin. That's ah, like her title. That's, that's a it's great title. It's amazing. It's amazing. What she does there is just phenomenal. But I have, I, took a one day uh, seminar with her once a few years ago. And I'd known people who'd taken like her whole week seminar, uh, but even just one day was just like, it was life changing. Just even just one day. That's... And I was, and I was just bubbling at the end of the day. Well, the whole day. That's like a Hogwarts kind of title. I love that. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> My favorite thing about her, again, we're, we're already way off our question list. I understand. It's, it's but, good. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> what I what I've heard that she does is that uh, she had she teaches us like at a lot of different levels, but she had all these graduate students, and she noticed that they were all miserable <laughs> because she 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 gets a lot of students who aren't artists. Mm -hmm. and she had all these PhD students who were like miserable working on their dissertations, and these were people in the sciences, in mathematics, in social sciences, all kinds of stuff. And so she got them all research assistants and the research assistants were all four-year-olds. <laughs> Love it. And so she would bring in the four-year-olds for like an hour or whatever. And the task was explain your dissertation to these four-year-olds. Mm -hmm, so each, mm -hmm. each, each grad student got a four-year-old. And in doing so, the four-year-olds asked questions. Mm-hmm. 
and you can't BS and you've got to be clear. <laughs> right. And it opened up the grad students' minds because the kids ask questions that nobody who's an adult and knows things thinks to answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the kids got excited and the grad students got excited in ways that they hadn't been before. And just hearing that story makes me go, she's amazing. Yeah, that's very cool. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and hopefully they got good grad assistant pay. You know, I hope so. That's a, that's a whole other story. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, let's hope. <laughs> yeah. That's, so you have this, this wonderful background and I, I also adore Linda Berry's work. Um, making comics is probably my favorite of hers. And I think my first question was something like the cultural impact of comics, because we're in this, it's always an interesting place in comics. You said that uh, 2002 was sort of the, the infancy or the dinosaur age of comics scholarship. And I'm curious, uh, I guess what your thoughts are about kind of the current trends, the impacts on culture, Right now, we're in this time where superhero movies have been big for about the past decade, uh, which are not comics, by the way. Those those are two separate right. <laughs> media. Um, yeah, and and now they're waning. Now people are going, oh, maybe we've had enough. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on the kind of the cultural impact of the medium, not just about superheroes, but in yeah. general. Yeah. Well, first I should say that 2002 was not exactly the dinosaur age of comic scholarship. I was being a little tongue in cheek there because it that had makes been me going feel for better. decades. That makes me it, feel it, better. <laughs> it makes me, it, it had been going for decades before that. I mean, when you have people like uh, Tom Inge and uh, John Lent, and even before that, and people like uh, uh, jo uh, Joseph Wittick and Amy Nyberg and mm -hmm. those kind of mm -hmm. folks like that. So this, I was like, kind of like maybe, maybe you could say third generation ish. I'm not sure, depending on how you define those things. But, anyways. Um, thinking about uh, when you meant when you mentioned this this question of the cultural impact of comics, again, the first thing people do talk about is the movies, the superhero mm -hmm. movies, but also think, but but there's only there's so many other movies that come from comics too mm -hmm. that people don't even think about as comics movies. Road to Perdition is the one that, uh, but again, at this point, that's so old that people don't even think about that movie much at all. But that was also but, 2002. <laughs> okay i'm part of me is still stuck in that year i think that's a great year uh, that's the year i got married so that's great <laughs> oh congratulations for that thank you thank you um but uh and there were so and there were there are so many other movies that people don't realize come from comics but at the same time the ones that people do know come from comics uh they don't lead people back to comics uh -huh. for the most part um, it, and the like the the big two or whatever like they always think that that's going to happen or the the these the the hero publishers like even kitchen sink i mean that's what finally killed kitchen sink was the movie the crow 2 mm. because the first crow movie was so successful and they thought that the crow 2 was going to be just as successful and they poured so much money into that movie mm -hmm. for tie-ins and merchandise and stuff like that because the first one caught everybody off guard, including them. So they thought, we're not going to get caught off guard this time. And they had so much promo merch, and it didn't carry through the same way. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but but like for Mar like every time there's a new Marvel movie, everything, every, all the comics get branded with the logo of that movie and stuff like that. I, I haven't seen any numbers, but I swear to God, if there's a bump or if there was a bump when the movies were really, really hot, mm -hmm. that bump has got to be so negligible as to be meaningless. Yeah. Uh, people will spend a hundred dollars on a jacket, but they're not going to spend $4 on a comic book. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, the property, the intellectual property is what's, is what's is what people are interested in 
they're not interested in the comics themselves. They're interested in the ideas from the comics mm -hmm. and the, the imagery from the comics and the ideas from the comics, but not the comics themselves. And so it becomes like this idea farm and some of the things like that. But what I think really where comics becomes uh, impact, where I think comics really impact society is just the the grammar and the form of comics mm -hmm. itself. I mean, you see it in advertising constantly. How many times do you see a word balloon or Ben Day dot? I've, to me, Ben Day dots are the record scratch of printed media mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because comics don't even use Ben Day dots anymore. Nobody does, but for every reality, because of pop art, and I mean, pop art doesn't even exist anymore, really, except in books and on museum walls. Nobody even makes it. But everybody, it seems, in culture understands that big dots mean comics, mean either kitsch or pop in some sort of way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when things are colored with, with big dots instead of gradations and things like that, that means kind of comic E or it means pop culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that comes from Lichtenstein, which comes from comic. Mm -hmm. So you see that used constantly. And again, that's an anachronism, just like the record scratch in every comedy movie where you're, where suddenly, and that's when like, the world goes crazy right. in, a, in a movie trailer. Again, kids don't, cassettes don't have a record scratch. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and and vinyl purists would never scratch a record. So uh, that, again, that's another mechanism, but it's like a visual equivalent. It's a synesthetic equivalent of a record scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the word balloon is just everywhere. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Yeah. I haven't sat on my Kindle. Oh, I've lost my Kindle. Okay, I can't show that. But uh, I had a good example of a... Here it is. Uh, I just discovered uh, the author Fernando, P Fernando Pessoa, uh -huh. who, was, uh, who I had never heard of until uh, about a week ago which shows how uh, uh, blind I am to world culture, uh, who's like the most popular author in uh, Portugal. Oh, nice. Yeah. The, uh, a modernist genius. And uh, this is a cover of, uh, this is one cover of one English translation of his book, The Book of Disquiet. And I'll hold this up. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, a thought balloon. Thought mm -hmm. balloon, speech balloons. Well, I really, really, what I really should do is just create a PowerPoint of, or a, a slideshow or a Prezi or whatever you want to call it, of just speech balloons and thought balloons where there are no comics because mm -hmm. it is just everywhere. True. It's it's you it's ubiquitous, and again, it doesn't mean it's comics, but everybody knows what it means. It signals thought. It signals expression. Mm -hmm. It signals excitement. In a way that just text doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And everybody intuitively understands that, even if they don't read comics. Every, uh, uh, advertising agencies aren't afraid to use it. Mm -hmm. and, and again, this is as high culture as you can get practically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Translated and, Portuguese and using... literature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, high modernist Portuguese literature. Yes. It's yeah. like, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's amazing. But you see things like that. Uh, word balloons, sequential panel scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, 
I, I am of the age where I am a member of AARP. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the <laughs> congratulations, the, the, the retired, <laughs> the retired person. Yes. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a dubious honor, but uh, they often have a comics page in the back of their monthly uh, newsletter ish magazine. Not, not, not the glossy one, the kind of a parade magazine version of the AARP magazine. Uh -huh. And they will have this big comic scene of people talking to each other and talking about some sort of issue or whatever. And very often, because the scene is very crowded, they will have a single word balloon with two tails, one pointed to one character, one pointed to another. Mm -hmm. And then they will have alternating paragraphs. And it's like, it doesn't really work. <laughs> right. It's like, they don't quite understand how comics work, but they're trying. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 it, but it's like, a, like even there, it's like they're, they're using, and sometimes they will use, I think Mark Zingarelli does it for them. They will have like these, uh, like kind of pop art images to illustrate uh, concepts every once in a while through there. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Uh, the the grammar of comics are everywhere and again even just the especially in advertising again advertising just permeates our culture but the the genres of comics and again genres of comics and genres of movies uh, genres of tv shows all that stuff kind of overlaps now anyways mm -hmm. but how many how many times do you see this right right in anywhere uh again uh, advertising commercials things like that but those kind of tropes are just everywhere uh -huh. um, and I think more than narratives I think it's the it's the grammatic it's, it's the grammatical and the kind of uh, the the kind of visual trope elements of comics that pervade culture more than the narratives themselves more than the more than comics narratives themselves the grander narratives are out there in the movies and things like that mm -hmm. but the elements of how the narratives get told are everywhere yeah and then and then sometimes and sometimes there's kind of bleed through like a this is not quite the same thing but i'm thinking of things like uh, graphic medicine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where uh suddenly comics become utilitarian or like the center for cartoon studies has their applied comics uh master's program i think it is master's degree where uh it's about using comics for specific purposes mm -hmm. uh, not just to be creative which again not that there, not that anybody's saying there's anything wrong with that but using it for a specific purpose uh, for graphic medicine, it's to help facilitate either understanding about a medical condition or to uh, help doctors communicate with patients better or to help family members understand what uh, another family member who's got a certain condition is going through or to help caregivers process what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just saw a uh, uh, something just came through the comic scholars discussion list this morning about uh, funding for an award for uh, the best uh, book in graphic medicine. Uh, that was, uh, they're looking forward to funding that uh, for the coming year. Um, graphic medicine is really fascinating to me. Um, I don't, I don't practice medicine. Uh, lately I've uh, been learning more about the medical system. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, it, I'm really interested in these kind of applied methods of cartooning, uh, for that stuff. I mean, I've seen things going back, uh, from like, uh, things that have been handed out, uh, like from anything from Jack Chick tracks to uh, a lot of health, uh, but also to a lot of like a uh, health, health literature. Uh, and again, I, I work at the Perseus Library of African Studies at Northwestern University. And we have so much information 
about uh, uh, like a public health information and also information like how to vote, like uh, in the first uh, free elections in South Africa mm -hmm. in 1994. And those were all about, and mo most of that information is in comics form because it communicates so immediately and directly mm -hmm. because a lot of the people that it's been was aimed at uh, had only basic liter literacy skills so being able to show at the same time as you're telling is really really useful yeah uh, so i think comics uh I think one of the one of your questions is like uh what was the what is if somebody's critical of comics, what's the strength? What's one of the strengths of the medium? And mm -hmm. one of the strengths of the medium is that fact that the multi, the the fact that it can show and tell at the same time mm -hmm. can be really useful for people who are struggling with reading, or or just for instruction. The other mm -hmm. big example there, of course, is Will Eisner uh, doing his instructional comics for the U.S. military. Uh, uh, the questionable uh, racial and anti-feminist stereotypes notwithstanding that those comics included mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, also, but it did the, uh, if, you, if, you, if you can manage to set those parts of them aside they did a good job of being able to teach how to take care of equipment so that it didn't break down when you least needed that to happen. Preventative maintenance. Yeah. And it was able to teach those things sequentially. I mean, what are IKEA directions? Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm curious. Um, so we've talked about kind of your history with the medium. We've talked about um, how the medium has taken up and is taken up uh, in in culture. Curious about the future and what you see kind of down the line for comics. Yeah. Um, my crystal ball is in the other room. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I have no clue. Um, I think it's the same question that you would ask about film or poetry uh-huh uh-huh it's to me comics can and do do whatever the person who has an idea wants to do with them mm -hmm. um uh, i i think uh you can do a lot i mean i mean the digital tools allow you to do a lot uh, but also so do good old analog tools. Right. Um, I'm interested in paper engineering also, and I know a lot of other cartoonists who do that as well. Uh, Ken Wong is somebody who does something called, he calls them origami comics. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I mentioned him last time or not. Uh, I remember. That sounds he fascinating did, though. Oh, he does. He does amazing, amazing things. He did one comic that is very much not based on Harry Potter. It's very much not based on Harry Potter. It's called Platform Three and a Half, which mm -hmm. is not based on Harry Potter. I got to make that very clear. But it's about a young boy who suddenly disappears in a train station mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by walking into a panel, walking into a wall. So he disappears between pages three and four. But page three as you page three will actually open up this way mm -hmm. and you can see where he goes ah, another dimension three, within a book another dimension within a book or he's got a book about uh uh the the box who opens the box to let off the demons. You're talking about Pandora's box. Pandora's box. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Thank you. I lost. The, I lost the word there. Uh, he he did a he did a comic about Pandora's box, 
which you get as a flat sheet of paper. And to actually read the comic correctly, you've got to build, you've got to fold the, the, the paper into a box. Oh, wow. And you can read the, then you can read the, the comic. But the only way to finish reading the comic, you need to open the box. Wow. Uh -huh. So you become Pandora. You have to <laughs> let the, you have to let the demons out to finish reading the story. I and mean, he's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wow. like, and so like, it's not just a gimmick. It becomes the reason for the shape of the book. Uh -huh. And he does, he's done lots of these things. And so I think there's, there's always another way to go with comics, depending on what your particular interests are. Uh, and again, when I went to the American Lang the American Library Association conference uh, earlier this year, uh, they had Zine Alley, mm -hmm. and there were people there making zines and mini comics that were completely inventive. Uh, the mini comic is not dead. Print is not dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Print is there was so much so much invention and innovation in print happening whether it was literal photocopies or uh this one woman i can't remember her name but she did this scratch board comic uh but like you know where you like have a like you do like crayon they're all these different colors and then you put black on top of it and then you do scratch board Mm -hmm. So that uh, it becomes like kind of neon colors under with black paper. And then she printed it on a home inkjet printer, but it looked like it was printed professionally. Nice. nice. It, it's one of the most gorgeous objects I've ever seen. And she made it in her house. She didn't <laughs> need a professional printer for it. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was just beautiful. And she was able to do it completely on her own without any any publisher not even not even a like a corner shop printer for printing house everything there's there's so many possibilities with print and again digital is a whole other realm that you can do lots of other things too uh but people are doing things with print even mm -hmm. that will blow your mind uh and i'm always interested in things that make my head explode that's what i tell people <laughs> Show me something that makes my head explode. And so many of these, especially the young kids, but even older people, I, there was a man who was about my age who had a zine called Mask Zine. And it was a, a very traditional zine, but it had two strings on it. So it looked just like a mask. And it was all about all the masks that he had worn during COVID. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> but it looked just like a mask. Yeah. So I just, yeah. I just love the, I love the, the continued inventiveness that people can do with comics. And again, that's the same thing that we see who thought Barbie would be an interesting movie. <laughs> you, the, any medium can do anything as long as you really put your heart into it. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I, I have a hard time finding what the next trend is going to be because the next trend depends on the next person who just opens up their heart to it. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. So one final official question, and that is um, current work that you've been involved in that you can talk about areas of creativity. Um, you, you seem to be a person who has lots of book recommendations, which I always appreciate. So this is also a wonderful space for that. Okay. Book recommendations. Well, the, the uh, I don't have any of them within easy reach, but uh, the work of cartoon is Johnny Dam, D-A-M-M. -M. Mm -hmm. is fascinating uh he's doing something called police comics in and he did a book called riot comics what he's been doing he's been taking uh uh the words of uh police union officials mm -hmm. and juxtaposing those with he takes old horror comics and old police comics and creating Again, using quotations from those uh, these speeches from police officers about the horrors in our streets, and then 
using images from like 1950s crime comics and he gets you to think about what people what current police officers are saying in a different way and he includes interesting uh, essays and things like that also mm -hmm. he did one also about uh uh the sto he did uh, i think riot comics is about the stonewall riots mm -hmm. and that one is really really powerful because it it juxtaposes what law officials were saying at the time with eyewitness accounts from people who were in the Stonewall riots or were attacked during the Stonewall riots by the police. Mm -hmm. Wow. Johnny yeah. Dam, D A M M, find his stuff. His stuff is utterly amazing. Jotting uh, it down. Uh, yeah, that's 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 that's, that's Gene's recommendation for the day. <laughs> um, and then uh, for uh, the stuff that I've been doing, uh, the most recent thing that I published came out last year. It was called Wakanda as a Window to the Study of Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was in a uh, book on using pop culture in a, the academic library. And I mentioned earlier that I work in Herskovitz Library of African Studies, which is the largest African studies uh, collection in the world. Uh, no library in Africa has as much about Africa as we do. We go back uh, the collection. The library was established in the 1950s as a separate library, but the collection goes back almost 100 years. Uh, and uh, when the Black Panther movie came out, mm -hmm. uh, our curator realized that, oh, people are interested in Africa. So let's get some of this stuff. So we we got a, we we got we started collecting uh, Black Panther comics and T-shirts and statues and action figures and yes I had a little bit of uh, sway in that but uh, what 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 my article does is it talks about some of this Black Panther ephemera that we have but then what I do is I juxtapose that with real world African history and African culture and items from our collection that talk about these things. Mm -hmm. And then this past uh, this past November, that was last month. That feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, early in November, I was able to give a talk at our library based on the article that I published last year. I had had, me, I had, had a uh, exhibit in our foyer where I had like one, one case that was, uh, we had our, big, uh, very large uh, Black Panther maquette and uh, some uh, a Shuri action figure and a uh, uh, Killmonger action figure. But then we also had other kind of toys and statuettes from throughout our collection. Mm -hmm. So we had... Uh, uh, we had some statues of uh, of uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu based on the drawings of the South African uh, editorial cartoonist Zapiro. We had a transformer like uh, footballer from the 19 oh, sorry from the 2010 uh south african uh fifa games mm -hmm. uh we had a uh an aids a beaded aids nurse doll from south africa we had uh just lots of different things we had a, had an obama action figure uh but lots of different statues and dolls and things like that just to kind of show the breadth of the collection mm -hmm. uh things like that i had another case where i had uh yeah uh, there's there a book that came out about uh uh wakanda that had like kimo, kimo, the kimoyo beads that everybody wears in the movie mm -hmm. one of the beads comes out and it actually has like a, an inf uh like a ultraviolet light on it that allows that shows you extra things in the book ah. and then i had some uh some beaded necklaces uh, from the collection, uh, commemorative uh, 
we had some like coffee mugs with Okoya on them. And then we also had some, uh, uh, some China that celebrated uh, Kenyan independence, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, just trying to show these things. We had a, a commemorative stamps, Black Panther stamps that Germany put out earlier this year. And then I paired those with stamps that were put out from the South African election, the first South African free elections, and also a big poster that had uh, talked about uh, the first stamps put out uh, in Libya, mm -hmm. the first Libyan elections and things like that. So just kind of showing that uh, so if you like this Black Panther stuff, there are real world equivalents to all these sorts of things. Yeah. 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 And then I gave this talk in which I was able to talk about a lot of the things that I talked about in my article, which unfortunately was published with zero images. The book, a book about popular culture in the library that was published with absolutely no images in any of the articles whatsoever, which was pretty sad. They said we could use two images and then they published it with no images. And I'm sure there was some, something on the public, on the, on the, publisher's end that mixed mm -hmm. all that i'm sure it wasn't the editors that did that i'm sure it was a publisher but uh i've got uh so i was able to do that and that was actually recorded and we got a we got a good uh video recording of that and up on my website i was able to uh uh put a link to the library wrote a nice big blog post about the talk uh, because uh, one of the people in marketing communications is a nerd like me and was very interested in that. So he wrote a big blog, a big blog post about that. And I just added a link to that on my website, which again, my website is comicsmachine.com, as in which Gene Gene, sure the comics it. machine, uh -huh. uh, because of uh, the uh, TV show from a billion years ago, Jean Jean the Dancing Machine. So I'm Jean Jean the Comics Machine. I like that's, it. I like that's it. what I do. Uh, but yeah, so that's there's a link uh, right up near the top of the of the of my website there to that. Um, but uh, so that was uh, really help. Hap I was happy to do that uh, because it, we had a pretty nice audience for that, and I was able to actually show the things that I could only talk about in the article. Uh -huh. And I was able to get into a lot more of the, a lot more of the historical things because the exhibit that I had up was more of the kind of poppy, happy things. But right. I was able to talk about things like, uh, you know, uh, in Wakanda you have this magical metal, vibranium, uh -huh. which makes everything happen. Well, we all carry magical African metal in our pockets uh it's called cold it, the in raw form it's called coltan mm -hmm. but it's uh, in its refined form it's in every cell phone in the world oh wow in wakanda nobody talks about how it's mined mm -hmm. you never see that happen in the real world coltan is often mined it's the it's often mined by uh, children. Uh -huh. uh, it's basically slave labor in, in some cases, ruled over by warlords. So you're you're carrying. We're all carrying around kind of like, not like blood diamonds, but it's kind of like blood, blood, blood metal. Oh wow! It's really dis. It's it's really disturbing when you start to think about it. But I learned about that. Because of vibranium. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I got to talk about, you know, fun things like that. So um, just going from happy popular cultural things, you get to learn about a lot of different real world things. And yeah. I get into a lot of that kind of stuff in the talk. The, the talk that uh, in the first Black Panther movie, when uh killmonger says uh don't try to save me bury me at the sea bury mm -hmm. me in the sea with my ancestors who knew that death was better than bondage mm -hmm. we have a we have a book in our collection that includes an eyewitness view 
and I and I I witnessed testimony of enslaved people jumping from the ships. Wow. So wow. we I was able to include like a screen grab of that text. Mm -hmm. And when I got to that point in the talk, I, I was going to read it out loud. I couldn't even read it out loud because it was just too much. But uh, so that's not just a dramatic moment in the movie. We have, again, because we because we have it, we have got, we have a literal first edition of eyewitness text of that. It was just finding that just kind of like that was one of those moments where you just sit down for a while. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, it's not just comic scholarship. It's it, it takes comics and it kind of moves into broader cultural questions. And uh, that I was really happy that I was able to do that. Uh, to get that out there, and it's now out on the web for uh, anybody to see. Yeah, yeah. And so again, like again, comicsmachine dot com, where you can also see uh, examples of my weird abstract acemic art. Also, wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, so much to explore there, and I'm just continuing to think about. Um, what you just shared with with cell phones and wow, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's a it's a little it's a little bit of a jump from uh, action figures to that, but uh, it all it all it all tied together. Yeah, yeah, and it's all part of the story. And amazing how you get there through, as you were saying, the the pop culture elements and and yeah. where those things come from. Yeah, so as I wanted to write for the longest time, and then when this call for papers for this book came out, I was like, okay, I've got no excuse now. I have to write this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Gene Cannonberg, Jr. Oh. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you, you for Dr. jumping Dark. on. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure, absolutely. Uh, glad to have you back anytime to talk about comics and projects to come and publishing and all of those things. And did, did we miss anything that you want to make sure to share? I'll make sure to link the, the website, but anything that we've missed. Uh, well, I, I will say that uh, my other big uh, passion is peanuts. I do have an essay in this book that came out a few years ago, the comics of Charles Schultz, the good grief of modern life. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a revision of an essay that I had published in uh, the journal of American humor several years ago uh and uh and uh, uh peanuts just does not leave my life and a sneak preview this book comes out in march this nice. is a pop-up book that i paper engineer i'm officially a paper engineer because that's what it says on my contract and it's also what it says on the title page nice uh, i got to take the first the very first peanuts comic strip and dimensionalize it in a cool Love little it. book and if you ever want to talk about that i'd be more than happy to talk about that process at a later date yes yeah and again this, this 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 comes out in march love it love it and that's like a whole other that's like life number five for me i think <laughs> <laughs> we will we will plan a talk and uh, again dr cannonberg thank you so much thank you very much jason